good afternoon, and on behalf of W Advance and our director, Dr. Casey Jackson, welcome to a conversation with John Trump Power Mulholland, civil rights icon and freedom writer, facilitated by Dr. Amina Anderson, assistant professor of practice and assistant director of WBU Advance. My name is Susana Mazuela Skirse, research assistant with WBU Advance. Before we get started, Advance would like to thank its campus-wide partners for their support in helping to make this event a reality. We would also like to extend a special thanks to Katie Farmer, Julie Black, Kirsten Barnacle, Sarah Hensley, and Jason Kapkala. We are happy that you could join us this afternoon. I would no further ado, we now turn to Akia Carter Bozeman, Prevention Specialist for Equity Assurance in the Division of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, who will introduce our guest of honor. Thank you, Susanna. Um, I am so honored today to introduce to you all Joan Trumpert Mulholland. Um, not only is she a civil rights icon, but I have the honor of calling her soar as she is one of my many, many sorority sisters. Joan Trevor Mahalan, a recipient of the 2015 National Civil Rights Museum Freedom Award, is a civil rights icon who participated in over 50 sit-ins and demonstrations by the time she was 23 years old. She was a freedom writer, a participant in the Jackson Woolworth sit-in, the March on Washington, the Meredith March in Selma in Montgomery, um, Alabama. From her actions, she was this for her actions, she was disowned by her family, attacked, shot at, cursed at, and put on death row, hunted down by the Klan for execution. Her path has crossed with some of the biggest names in civil rights movement, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Megger Evers, Fannie Lou Hamer, John Lewis, Diane Nash, and Julian Bond, just to name a few. As a white Southern woman, her courage and fortitude in the movement is highly regarded and recognized. Joan has appeared in several books, including Coming of Age in Mississippi, Breach of Peace, We Shall Not Be Moved, and the newly illustrated children's book, Her Life, She Stood for Freedom. Her story and experiences were highlighted in award-winning documentaries, including PBS's Freedom Writers, Standing on My Sister's Shoulders, the groundbreaking film Eyes on the Prize, and um, her son, Loki Mulholland, directed and wrote the award-winning documentary about her courageous life entitled An Ordinary Hero, the true story of Joan Trevor Mulholland. She has received numerous awards and recognitions for her work in the civil rights movement. Most recently, she received the 2020 MLK Day of Peace and Freedom Award from the National Action Network. In 2018, she received the I Am A Man Award on the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination. In 2014, Joan and other female freedom writers were recognized by President Barack Obama. She also received the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated Annual Award of Honor and Anti-Defamation League of Annual Heroes Against Hate Award. After retiring from a 40-year career of teaching English as a second language, she also started the Joan Trevor Mulholland Foundation, which is dedicated to eradicating racism and educating youth about the civil rights movement. Joan is a graduate of Tougaloo College and was the first white member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, a historically African-American sorority. It is my esteemed honor and pleasure to welcome Joan Trapper Mahano to the virtual stage. Joan, it is such an honor to finally be able to have this long awaited conversation with you. I feel so much gratitude that the pandemic that delayed us did not defeat us. We are here a year later, having been postponed, yes, but present now. Here you are, a living legend, a civil rights movement veteran, my soror, live and in person with us virtually in our home among the hills. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, soror. And as we would, we're not out. We were just we were just down for a while, but we weren't out. That's right. That's we right. Shall yeah. overcome. <laughs> yes, and, and in fact, we did. Right. That is what yes. we do. And and here we are a year later, and I'm so excited for this wonderful honor 
uh, the WVU campus has just been exuberant and excited about your visit. We have lots of faculty and administrators and staff and students watching and very interested in what you will share with us today. So in thinking about the first question that I would pose to you today, tell us what it means to you today in this moment in history to be referred to as, to be a civil rights icon. Tell us what that is like, given this very moment that we live in today. Well, it's a high compliment. I never thought I was, you know, anyone special in the movement, maybe as a white Southerner, I was in a different role, but we were all in it together and we were all equally important. So I think mm. the title, you know, the, the titles they give us now and the accolades are for everybody. Mm, yes, yes. So this is really, when you talk about all, tell me who all you are making reference to. Well, since it comes out of the civil rights movement, which was basically black and white together, there were a few mm -hmm. other folks here and there, a um, few Hispanics, a few Asian Americans, um, maybe a Native American or two. But basically, mm -hmm. you know, it was black and white together, we shall not be moved as the song went. Yes, yes. Well, what I wanted to share with you is that some of those watching today have viewed uh, your son Loki's uh, film, a documentary about your life, An Ordinary Hero. There are others who may not have viewed the film. And so what I'd like to share is that, you know, before we uh, recount your journey uh, to the civil rights movement, you know, the work that you did, we'd like for you to dive into and, you know, highlight your activism. Um, but before that, talk about you, Joan, the daughter of a Southern mother and a Yankee father um, who would ultimately become a freedom rider. So if you would take us back to Joan, the Southern little girl uh, growing up who would eventually uh, become this freedom rider. Well, I was actually born in Washington DC, but when they brought, which was the South then, when they brought me mm -hmm. home from the hospital, it was to these new apartments, brand new, Apartments in Arlington, Virginia, as the saying goes, uh -huh. across the river. Um, not in DC, said as a compliment, but you know, back where it's mm -hmm. the South. And um, I grew up there. Uh, Robert E. Lee is my homeboy. I make no apologies for him. He did do some good things. Um, but the apartments were noteworthy for the fact they would rent to Jewish couples. Most places mm -hmm. would not rent to Jews in, um, back then. In fact, in some cases in housing and all, it was in the deed. Everybody, it could not be sold or, went, or rented to. But this one development did rent to Jewish families and you had lots of folks from the liberal New York Jewish wing who came down to Washington, D.C. Um, just like my parents both came for um, the New Deal's, those good government jobs. And now with families, they wanted to get out of the boarding houses and what have you and have an apartment. So most of my, the vast majority of my playmates were from these liberal New York Jewish families. And whereas they weren't trying to really um, convert us to their way of thinking, um, you sort of absorbed a lot of, of that, you know, osmosis. Mm -hmm. Now the, my mm -hmm. playmates were, you know, threatened, you know, you can't tell her there's no Santa Claus and there's no Easter bunny. And our, us Christian kids, our Christmas presents were hidden in the top of their closets. So we couldn't sneak around and find out what we were getting for Christmas. And they couldn't tell us what they saw. You know, they all knew, mm -hmm. but they couldn't tell us. And, um, so I had that influence, but mm. everything was segregated. Um, mm. I was pretty oblivious to it. Um, 
not that I questioned it or opposed it. I would have, I think, in time, but I was oblivious to it. And we were mm -hmm. proud of Robert E. Lee. Um, I will say on Robert E. Lee's behalf that when he and his wife left their plantation, they deeded their land over to the slaves. Hmm. They gave it to them. But the federal government that occupied the plantation refused to recognize their deeds. So um, all the bad folks aren't on one side or and all the good folks aren't. Well, my daddy was from a small town in Iowa. And the town doctor had a good friend from his college days who would come to visit. And he would visit in Iowa when my daddy was a kid. And he became the hero to every kid in this little Iowa town because he brought peanuts and he'd throw them out in the grass for a scavenger hunt. And um, you couldn't get fresh produce. This was before planters and all that. And so, um, who do you think this guy was, his friend of the doctor? Hmm. I, I have I have a clue of who that might have been. It wasn't Jimmy Carter, which is what some folks yeah, say. I, who was yeah, it? Yeah, I'm wondering. Were you talking about George Washington Carver? Yes, indeed. This black guy with peanuts was the hero to every white kid in this little town. So you know daddy didn't grow up prejudiced. Mama, however grew up in rural Georgia. Uh, her family had been sharecroppers. Not all sharecroppers are black. I hate to tell folks, disillusion them, but the truth is there are plenty of white sharecroppers and the law, the church, the society all supported segregation and um, superiority, inferiority. And so my parents just agreed to disagree because they had other mm. things to think about. Mm. And so I had these conflicting influences on my childhood. Mm. But um, when I was about 10, uh, visiting grandma down in Oconee, Georgia, not that fancy mm -hmm. resort. This is an old company owned logging town with a, just a dirt road down the middle of the white section and off to the turn off of that and there was an even worse dirt road through the black section. And my playmate, same playmate every summer, we sort of dared each other to go walk through the colored. Colored was the polite term then, calling somebody black was fighting words. Mm -hmm. But we dared each other to go down there and it was creepy because people saw these two little white girls coming down the road. They just made themselves scarce. They might be out sweeping their yard. They put down that broom and went inside. And that that was, you know, ooh. But then it got to where um, the colored school was. And it was just shocking. It was a shack, never been painted. The door was ajar. You could see the pot-bellied stove. No glass or screens in the window, just wooden shutters, no playground equipment. No grass in the schoolyard, just a hand pump for water and just one outhouse. So I'm telling you this unisex bathroom movement, that ain't nothing new. They had it in Georgia back in the fifties. Well, it was bad enough looking at it, but I knew out the other end of town was the fanciest building for miles, a brand new brick school for the white kids. Still the fanciest building, but now it's the senior citizen complex. And I just knew this was not right. This is not mm -hmm. what we learned in Sunday school to treat people the way we want to be treated. And I sort of resolved, or I couldn't have put it in words, that when I had the chance to make the South the best it could be for everybody, I would seize the moment. I yeah. kept my mouth shut yeah. about it. And that came in um, college. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, as I knew what happened, you ended up answering some of the questions that I wanted you to reflect upon 
um, I think that was a very pivotal moment in the film when you and your friend Mary, I think her name was, yes. talk about going into this Black town. And, and specifically, I jotted down this language you used around making the people, the citizens, the Black citizens of, the, of that town, making themselves invisible upon seeing you and Mary, the, you know, sort of saunter into their space. And it, at the age you were, as I was watching it, I was thinking about, uh, you know, I watched it a second time, but it made me think about, you know, when you were reflecting on this discrepancy that you uh, saw, noticed, was, was, was aware of this dissonance in Sunday school, what they were saying, and then, of course, uh, what you were seeing in the outside world. And so this being the thing that, you know, seemed to drive your commitment. And, you know, it's sort of interesting, uh, Joan, because in my own research, this, this question about why do dominant group members uh, get involved in social justice work, right? So if we're talking about whites who get involved in anti-racist work, men who get involved in anti-sexist, pro-egalitarian work, straight or cishet people who get involved in LGBTQIA rights work. Um, and examining your story, uh, what struck me is that it seems to have been uh, in, in the most compelling way, this issue around your faith, right? This deep religious conviction that you had, these Bible teachings that really sparked your awareness of social injustices. I mean, you made reference to that just, just a bit ago, yeah. um, and you're interested in making things right. Uh, today, many attribute their stark support of politicians like our most recent past president, policies and practices, legislation that is uh, oppressive and discriminatory to their, uh, they attribute these, uh, their support of these politicians, these policies and practices, are often attributed to their faith. So in the CGN evangelical movement, we had lots of people who uh, stand behind and support and lift up their faith as the reason uh, for this level of support. What, what are your thoughts about that? Talk, talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, these attributions to faith now. And I, I'd like for you to think about it in terms of the role that faith has played uh, that it played in the civil rights movement in terms of those of you who fought for justice and in terms of those who were resisting you, the people who were advocates for Jim Crow, what role faith played there, and then, you know, your reflections on today. Well, I will say first, I just don't understand how they justify this um, being against other folks under faith, I, that just confuses me. Now, not all evangelicals agree with that. Some of them um, are very supportive of, of the movement then and the movements now. Maybe not LGBT, but um, the others. Mm -hmm. And it just, I'm just confused by it. Now the, the church, had a big role in the civil rights movement. Um, a lot of the leaders were pastors. Mm -hmm. um, the only place that blacks really controlled in their community was the church. It wasn't owned by the white folks. Mm -hmm. So the, the meetings were held in the church. The music reflected the church music. It just took the songs everybody knew and changed a few words and made them freedom songs instead of church songs. Mm -hmm. And the picket signs and the speeches and all, they also mm -hmm. frequently reflected um, the church. So mm -hmm. it was really pivotal, pivotal um, to the civil rights movement. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of support for um, the different movements today come from the church, or at least mm -hmm. from faith, whatever faith. Um, mm -hmm. Now, some of the opposition does too, they, they use that, but I think, oh, I, th I just see it as personal greed on the other side. They want it all for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Or 
communism was, you know, we were accused of being communists back then because those were the bad guys. And it mm -hmm. still gets reflected on now. Communist, yeah. um, though communism had nothing to do with, you know, as a political entity had nothing to do with the civil rights movement. Yeah. Well, we know, you know, Dr. King really talked about and challenged the faith community um, during the, the civil rights movement for its call. Of course, this is reflected in uh, the letter from the Birmingham jail, this, this uh, call on the faith community to really just, you know, the faith community responding, you know, th this is not the time, you know, and, and really challenging them to uh, step up, you know, in a way. And so in thinking about you and the age that you were thinking about that a lot as someone who spent my career in higher education, I think about you as a young college student in that age range and thinking about the world. We often talk about this sort of liminal existence that uh, is this time between when students who have the, who afforded the opportunity to go to college right before you move into adulthood, there is this space where you get to sort of figure things out and, and you know, kind of find out who you are as a college student. And so in really finding yourself, I was really intrigued by uh, what I learned about your experiences at Duke University, getting in the conversation or the expectation that you had uh, you know, in terms of what college you would probably attend, and then your mother not wanting you to uh, attend some of the schools that were further north. What, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, clearly, it's, you know, fair to say that your college experience was atypical for a young uh, white woman at that time. Tell us a little bit about your college experience, about Duke, about your defiance, uh, you know, how Duke uh, perceived you, and, and share a little bit with us about that. Well, I'll go back to that um, I had wanted to go to the college in Ohio that my Sunday school teacher and her husband went to, a little Presbyterian church school. I was tired of an mm -hmm. overcrowded school, like my high school, um, but it was in Ohio. Mama wasn't gonna have anything with that because it could be integrated. Now, my Sunday school teacher, husband's name was John Glenn. You've heard of him. Yeah. Yes. For anybody that hasn't, he blasted off into space, not in fury, but in pride. And, um, but mama was, a, you know, completely against it. She was prestige oriented and she was afraid it might be integrated and all. So she wanted me to go to Duke and I just figured, okay, this will get me out of the house. I just gave up finally and went. And that was 59, fall of 59 in 1960, in the February 1st, the sit-in started in Greensboro and quickly spread everywhere, including Durham. Well, I went to this um, Presbyterian Sunday evening youth meetings and still a good church going girl. And our chaplain said, one evening, next week, some students from North Carolina College are going to be here to speak to us. Now keep it pretty quiet. Um, only tell folks you're sure would want to attend. Well, I mean, this administration could lock us out. The rowdies could show up. The police could arrest us, all that type of thing. But my roommate, I thought, would want to go. And she came with me. and these well-spoken, well-dressed young folks from North Carolina College, they came and explained to us about the demonstrations that they were having in town. And they put it in moral and legal terms and then shock, they invited us to join them. So a few of us did, including me and my roommate. That led to the picket lines, that led to jail, and that led to the Duke administration going ballistic. I mean, they wouldn't have it. They would. And the only thing that kept us from being expelled was the, I found out years later, was the university professors group. 
But meanwhile, wow. we did have to have some psychiatric counseling and da di da di da. And I remember one professor who I suspected supported us. I said that he was an English professor and English was not my subject. Uh, sir, they're, we're planning a demonstration when it, and I may be in jail when you have your next class. Now, if you give one of your pop quizzes, could I please make it up when I get out of jail? And he gave a big smile and laughed and said, oh no, I'm gonna bring it down to the jail for you because you can't cheat in there. And he just laughed and, you know, very supportive. And some mm -hmm. of the other professors. And um, well, I finished out my semester. Um, in the dorm, there were girls who were slipping us money and saying they sorry they couldn't join us, but their daddies would lose their jobs. And there mm -hmm. were others who quit speaking to us. But wow. you know, it was a mixed bag. And um, yeah. so that was my dream yeah. experience. But I did get yeah. honorable grades, you know. Yes. Made the honor roll. Well, I'm, Pardon? I'm happy to hear. I am so happy to hear you uh, share that piece of um, your history with us, in part because many of us who are watching today are faculty, and this idea, this notion of um, academic freedom for us continues to be an important and compelling one. The opportunities we have to support students, and certainly in that time frame, you being able to feel some uh, degree of comfort and safety, uh, you know, as a young person uh, exploring your own right to exist and resist, right? And so I really appreciate that part of the story. I, I read uh, somewhere as I was digging up that you were also, it was mentioned, it may be in one of the uh, books that was on the Freedom Riders, that, that you also talked about there being uh, the Duke administration was curious why you weren't out going to all of the rushing the first couple oh, of weeks. Oh, yes. Sororities. Well, rush week was like your first week in school. You didn't even know your way around campus good yet. And you were supposed to pay money and go get dressed up and go sit there and get selected by these sororities people who you didn't know. You hadn't been there long enough to know anything about them. And my roommate and I thought, well, that is not for us. And the internet, the same night as Rush Night, the International Club, mostly good looking graduate school guys, were having a potluck dinner and dance. And we thought that sounded oh so much more fun. So we went to that. And the Duke administration was said it never happened before that, you know, you didn't go to rush week and, and were we unhappy? Did mm. we not have the money? You know, all that type of thing. And now we just weren't interested. Yeah, and but, it's sort of interesting, these expectations they put on young women about where they believe our focus should be or what are the things that we ought to be doing and interested in in order to be considered normal. Right? Yeah, well, we were interested in the guys. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not, that's not abnormal, but there is there were some clear parameters in terms of what they thought you should be doing as a young woman, what should you know hold your interest. So I thought that was an interesting piece to include. Beyond the Duke years, so I know there became this time in higher education, we talk about it as stopping out, we sort of stop out of school for a while. And I wanted to understand as we start to talk about your role in the uh, very first act of protest, right? So the first time you participated in a movement, and then I do want you to, as you recount this, Talk to us about how you ended up at Tougaloo College in Mississippi, a, a historically black uh, university college, and then uh, sort of connect those dots for us. So the moment that you, uh, where you're leaving Duke and now you're you know, in, involved in your first protest, tell us about maybe starting out by thinking about that first protest, what was going through your head? How did that first pro protest lead to the next protest that you would have and then your uh, 
you know, subsequent well, involvement. In that we case. have been invited to come down and join the protest in Durham. So mm -hmm. I did that. And um, I stuck out the semester, got mm -hmm. my credit hours. That's mm -hmm. always important. And then I split. Duke and I were not compatible. And I came back up to Washington, D.C. Well, the NCC students we were protesting with, they, they had not heard anything from Howard University since the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had been formed um, on spring break. And they, you know, no internet and even a long distance phone call was a big deal. So they asked, some of those students asked me when I got to, back to DC to go to Howard, find out what was happening, encourage them if they weren't doing anything and please, you know, send a letter back to um, the NCC guys and let them know what was happening. So I went to Howard and asked around and found some um, students who had been doing sympathy pickets in front of um, variety stores that were segregated in, in the South. And they were planning to have sit-ins in Arlington. So in just a few days. And when they found out I had been arrested, you know, this white girl, they didn't know showing up. Um, but they found out I had been arrested in sit-ins, had a little experience there, and I was from Arlington. They encouraged me to join them in the sit-ins. So I did. And we sat in and what have you. Now I talked about being in from this, um, these apartments when I was a little kid with the liberal New York Jews. Well, some of those families with the now, you know, settled in in DC well and, and started or were owning, managing, what have you, these places with lunch counters. And um, that's important with our sit-ins because we called off, called a pause after about a week of sitting in here and there and no arrest. Um, we wanted to give the stores and the authorities a chance to talk about this and went back in a week or so to sit in again. And lo and behold, we got served. Shock, awe, all that. So it turns out that the prosecuting attorney said he was not going to enforce the state law against public assembly. And under that, not only the people who sat together at a lunch counter or a church or a park or something, picnic ground, not only they could be arrested, but the people who enabled them, you know, the minister, the park ranger, or the lunch counter manager could be arrested as well as us. And so, mm -hmm. though they had no problem serving us, they weren't ready to go to jail that day. So once mm -hmm. they didn't have to worry about going to jail, they served us. And then the neighboring mm -hmm. counties and things said, well, Arlington does it, we'll do it too. And that took care of the eateries in Northern Virginia. So then we took on an amusement park in um, Maryland. This was before, you know, Six Flags and Disney and all that. And um, that took care of the summer. And yeah. Well, that, thank you for taking us and explaining to us, you know, exactly how uh, these systems work and some of the choices that were made. We don't, we don't always hear about that um, in the telling of our history, which is why I think it's just such a, a, a great opportunity to have you be able to uh, provide this narrative for us and this look through your eyes at uh, how these things unfolded. I noticed that on your shirt, you have this iconic, mug shot of you yeah. That, yeah yeah and we certainly took advantage of using that in our promotional are you standing up for us so people i'm can trying to stand up i don't know if you can see yeah. it or not. Yeah, they well, see it and, can and you I read was, read what it says at the I, bottom i can't read what it says at the bottom well, it know. says this is my government issued id there um, we go my son loki had this done up for me Okay. There's another one that says I'm a Delta. Okay. And um, same mug shop, but you know. And well, mm -hmm. so ahead, it's Lord. just my son's sense of humor. 
Yes, yes. Well, I, I, I think that's wonderful. I actually wanted to talk to you about that mugshot of you. Um, and, you know, interestingly, I took my daughter, who is now on the verge of her 16th birthday, with me to visit national headquarters. But we also visited the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. And we visited your display there. And wow. of course, that mugshot is there. And um, it is, you know, unequivocally provocative, right? So, although, you know, sort of interesting because it's unclear from your facial expression in the photo if you intended for the photo to be provocative, the expression on your face. I mean, I would imagine you would have been scared, but if you were, the mugshot, in my opinion, at least, did not capture the image of a frightened young, young woman. Share with us what you remember yeah. about the moment. I don't really remember much about the moment that it was taken, but um, I mean, I'm a Southerner. I understood the game. We knew we were gonna be arrested when we went. Um, and been arrested um, at the, well, I'll backtrack a little bit. I was with a group after the first Freedom Rides were stopped, the group that flew from Washington DC to New Orleans and then took the train back. And you've heard of Kwame Torrey, Stokely Carmichael, my buddy, and we were friends to the end. I claim credit yeah. for bringing Stokely into the deep South. Oh, and wow. with the fist, I know we usually make a, you know, a tight fist here, like we're gonna knock someone out. I found out when I was in South Africa, the fist is always thumbs up. And I okay. think that's a lot more positive, yeah. Okay. So when the paddy wagon after we'd been arrested, we took the Illinois Central and got off in Jackson, didn't go all the way to Chicago, promptly arrested and in the paddy wagon. And when I went to step out of the paddy wagon, this would not have happened if I'd been black, I'm clear on that but I was looking like this sweet young thing. And this police officer took my arm to, and said to help me out of the paddy wagon, big step and I'm a little short thing. We don't want a thing to happen to you chillin. And then I knew that things were gonna work out in the end. Mm. So I was confident that we would succeed I was a member of the Southern culture, participant, knew the game. Um, so I was not frightened and they mm -hmm. took a day or two to, to do this. Now about that police officer saying, we don't want anything to happen to you. When they had the 50th reunion of the Freedom Riders and we were having breakfast on the grounds of the, um, governor's mansion and there were a bunch of you know officials and dignitaries and by then you know 50 years later the head of the Jackson City Police and the head of the State Highway Patrol were both black gentlemen mm. well I went over you know with my camera to get a little picture of them to the rope that separated us from them and they turned their heads didn't want any part of that. Then yeah. after the dignitary spoke, the Freedom Riders, if they wanted to say a few words, could. And I told that story. Yeah. And after that, these two gentlemen were over wanting to get their picture taken with me. Complete reversal. So mm -hmm. that, that was a good moment. But. Yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I don't know. I'm just rambling. No, no, I, you, you are really, um, you know, sharing a lot of wealth of information with us. And I was thinking, you know, when you were talking about um, the treatment that you receive, you know, getting held, you know, as you come down the, um, out of the bus and we don't want you to get hurt. Were there ways in which you perceive that your presence, your whiteness, uh, helped in any way to alleviate how maybe these authorities acted and, and how it might be different. So not just you, because I know that there were some other um, 
uh, freedom riders and there were some other white activists in these spaces at the times. Do you perceive ways that your presence may have helped? Did, did you, do you think that it triggered more anger? Um, tell me about your thoughts about that. Well, a lot of times when the white folks who, you know, segregationist sorts saw a white person in the crowd, they focus their attention on, on the white freedom rider, on the white sit-in student. Um, not that it's, you know, saved anybody, but it helped. Mm. And being white, you could also do things that other um, black participants couldn't do. You could get information. Mm -hmm. I went into the citizen, White Citizens Council office once and got some of their literature. At the amusement park, I'd gone there as a kid. I could walk in and buy all the tickets. Then I could right. go back out and hand them out. And, you know, folks yeah. would get arrested on the merry-go-round holding the ticket. And mm -hmm. um, at the day of the Jackson Woolworth sit-in, I could be, me and another white lady were just sort of blending in the crowd on the, you know, down on the street um, when a there was a picket line set up to be a diversion while the sit-in kids original group got in and we could just blend into the crowd. Mm -hmm. And so there were plenty of times you could do things that a black um, freedom fighter couldn't do that would help out, but you mm -hmm. didn't try to take over things and tell folks how to do things. You tried to do what the, group that it affected the most wanted you to do. Yes, yes, interesting. I, I'm so happy that you shared that with us. I think that offers us some really important insights about this way in which um, as a white activist, you were able to leverage uh, your, your whiteness, your skin color, your appearance in order to work on behalf of the movement. And, and, and then also uh, these opportunities uh, sometimes, you know, to really deflect attention away from, uh, you know, whether you intended to or not, you know, maybe this was the residual effect of your very presence uh, being there. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to move to my next question because I know we have an audience that is probably so eager to ask yeah. you lots and you of gotta, questions. And you got to cut me off because once I get going, I can talk forever. <laughs> I think you're doing a fabulous job. And I, and I think that you are sharing lots of things that we may not have gotten to if I didn't allow you to just share. Remember, this is a conversation. I purposely, uh, you know, yes, it's an interview, but I purposely wanted to invoke this idea of a conversation. So thank you for, and in, in continue in this vein. I think that we're, we're really covering a lot of um, important um, insights here. So what, I said this before, but of course, your activism unfolded, you know, in this era where the stakes were not uh, were not just high; they were literally a matter of life and death. You know, amidst the countless brutal murders of countless Black activists, freedom riders during that era, some less well known in history than others. I think about your story, and I am reminded of the story of uh, Viola Riozo, a white woman from Detroit yes. who had been inspired by Dr. King and who helped coordinate marches from Selma to Montgomery, who was fatally shot and killed by Klansmen pursuing her by car. Uh, being white and activist wasn't trending then. And, and she was dragged in the media, her character assassinated. Tell us what you remember um, about her death, about the times you were sure you would die. I know that you talked about that in the film some. Well, when she. Oh, I sorry for interrupting you. Okay, sorry, sorry, but John, uh, we need you to shift a little bit your set from, from the sun. Yeah, oh. thank you. Yeah, now we can see you. Perfect. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. Yeah. Thank well, you. Well, the sun shifts and, you know, <laughs> it hits me differently. What if Forrest Gun tell us shift happens? Right, so we're we're good. We can see you. Are you Joan? Okay. Hello. Now Viola Liuto. Yeah. Um, yeah. By then, I 
I heard when I heard she'd been telling, I thought that could so easily have been, and she had had all the, she had these kids behind, and she was shot because she was white mixing with the black folks. She was ferrying folks from Montgomery back to Selma. And I guess that was my main thought. That could have been me. Mm -hmm. I was so close to it on occasion, but. Yeah. The reason I also brought I guess that it up. just wasn't my time. Yeah. And, and um, of course, we are grateful that you are a veteran, that you did end up um, surviving that. But we also recognize all of the many uh, revolutionaries and activists who, who did not make it out, but whose work is, you know, permits us to be here today having this conversation. Me, as a Black woman, being able to interview you and have this conversation. Um, given what you have experienced thinking about the memory of uh, Viola, what are your observations about young white activists today? How are they similar to you or other white activists that you have known? How are they different? Uh, talk to us about those differences. What do you want them to know? I want them to know that, well, the situation is different now because even though it might be Black Lives Matter, when you see a march, it's everybody. Mm -hmm. There's no majority in most of the marches. It's just everybody out there. But still mm -hmm. the group that it affects the most mm -hmm. that you know began it, they are the ones that have to make the decision about what to do and how mm -hmm. you can be useful. And mm -hmm. so get your marching orders from the leadership. Mm -hmm. The other thing for folks who are want to do something, I say for everybody on the front lines, there has to be an equal number having their back. Mm. So if you aren't one of the marchers, you can make the signs, mm. you can drive the cars, you can put people up in your home overnight, you can cook food, you can just be there observing what's happening mm -hmm. so that when the question mm -hmm. comes up, you can tell. So uh, you're every bit as part as much of the movement when you're having people's back and we need both groups in about equal numbers for it to be successful. Yes, yes. Really, really powerful um, messaging. And I, I appreciate that. I'm sure that those watching do as well. It was sort of interesting in my conversations with Loki, I must have mentioned this word ally. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, whatever you do, do not call my mother an ally. And I was like, oh, okay. Cause I think that a lot of people uh, might conceptualize your work as being the work of an ally. Certainly theoretically, the way that you talk about um, this role of allies, particularly deferring um, decisions around leadership in the direction that we go to the people most affected, as you describe it, aligns well with some definitions of allyship. But talk to us about why you push back against that particular label. I guess it has to do with my age. When I was growing up, ally talked, meant a group of people, of countries that were united in a fight. Germany, Japan, and Italy were allies. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Great Britain and the US and France were allies. And it has such a militaristic um, meaning to me. And furthermore, I wasn't just supporting the movement. I was part mm -hmm. of the movement, I and recognized as such by the black students in in the movement even got um, picked to be on the inner circle, the coordinating council of yeah. the student movement. So yeah, yeah. I I you know I I was also you know I do a little digging around and I I, I read something that talked about the time. I think this is in the book and uh, the breach of. Oh, I can't think of the last. Uh, part of that title, 
but it talked about when you were, yes, uh, it talked about when you were locked up in that notorious uh, Mississippi uh, prison, I uh, forget the name of it. Actually, Parchment. Had yes. Parchment Parchment. Prison Farm. Yes, and you and you talked about uh, well, well, you were excited with saying that you thought the uh, young women that you were uh, who were also you know involved in in the movement, I, I guess, were wonderful, but you felt uh, more of an affinity, and they quoted you with the Negro girls, so the Negro women, and I thought that was sort of interesting because I I, ha I, I will uh, be called on to to be accountable if I don't mention that. You know, uh, I think in your introduction, Sora Kia Carter talked about you being the first white member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. Talk to me a little bit about how that came to be and, and this um, affinity that you felt uh, with, with, you know, these women. And my presumption is that because you were fighting alongside or that you got to know at your uh, HBCU. Okay, um, we'll go back to, to jail. Um, the white women in the cell, they were all Yankees who had mm. come on the freedom rides. I respect and appreciate that because they did not approve of white Southerners. And I was the only white Southerner in that segregated cell. And they didn't even know how to eat grits and they didn't know what black eyed peas were. Oh, they were hopeless. And the girls in the black cell, there was just a cinder block wall between the cells, they had been, they were in the movement and we had shared experiences in the movement. And we all mm -hmm. knew that you sang like you were in church. You didn't want to sound like you were on a Northern Union picket line. That's mm -hmm. a whole different way of singing. And mm -hmm. um, so I felt much closer to the black girls who had been in the movement rather yeah. than, you know, picket lines in the North. Yeah. And now what was the second part of that? Well, I was asking you to get to how you ended up becoming the first white member of Delta Sigma Theta. Well, so, well I was at Tougaloo College, which I got to um, because I felt that segregation had to be a two-way street, not just a couple yeah. of black kids under court order being you know, harassed, driven off campus, tear gassed, all that at a at a college and I talked my idea of going to a, a, what we would now call an HBCU. I talked that idea over with the SNCC inner core and I think everyone agreed that was a good idea. And if you're gonna do it, someone says, you may as well go to Mississippi because those kids haven't done anything down there yet and you can help them get started. And mm -hmm. Tougaloo was the only colored school, as it was then called, that was accre nationally accredited. So I went, mm -hmm. I applied there, and my high school refused, very point blank, refused to send my transcripts. But mm -hmm. Tougaloo said, I'll accept you on your Duke transcripts. So that's how I got there. Now, to become a Delta, um, I'd been on campus and you had to be on campus long enough for people to know you and you to know them. And there was the same, they were all from my roommates and the same crowd was at the civil rights meetings and at the Delta meetings. We were not the goody girls, not to call names on anybody else, but you know who I mean. Mm -hmm. And um, I could definitely pass the paper <laughs> the brown bag test but um mm -hmm. but yeah. um it was a, my, my my just the regular crowd i hung with so i got invited so it, by and joined yeah yeah gave me a well, social awesome. base I, yeah. yeah well it, it makes sense that uh the first white member of our organization that is really driven by our service mission and certainly during that era are concerned with matters of social justice that, you know, it would be someone of your uh, experience, caliber and interest who would uh, become the first white member. So I am happy to have you as a soror and that I got to be a part of uh, Thank you, this organization. 
Yes, in our, in our legacy. Thank you so much. Um, so here we are. And, and what I'd like to do is um, I, I watched An Ordinary Hero. I, I mentioned this earlier a second time. I said, okay, now I'm going to be interviewing her. Let me watch this again. And, and when I did that, I caught something that I had not caught in the beginning. And it was the opening scene where Loki is uh, looking and sort of going through your memorabilia. And he, he says that, you know, I... I remember the photos, but I didn't know the stories behind the photos. And he talks about uh, the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides in 1961. And that year really being the one where you, you and he, I guess you began to really talk about your story and the two of you travel uh, to Mississippi, I believe. Tell me uh, about that year and, and what was it that caused you to begin to uh, tell him the stories behind the pictures. Oh, he just knows how to write a good story. He had heard all the stories. We would be at, you know, one of my college friends' houses. Oh, That's not quite the way it is, Mom. <laughs> all right. <Loki>. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> it's not your turn, son. If you're going to start spilling tea, I've got but something for you. He had heard most of the stories, most, not okay. all, but okay. we would be getting together with my old friends and visiting Tougaloo College and folks down there still, but all the kids just wanted to escape those old folks hashing out all their old war stories, as it were, and they wanted to get loose and go play. They weren't paying any attention to what we were saying. They just wanted out of there, right. so he had heard them. And um, usually he agrees that that's the way it was, okay. but not today. Gotcha. And um, so then he got, once he got older and more mature in his thinking and interest, uh, stuff started coming out. Yeah, yeah. He paid attention. Yeah, well, I, I think that you framed that, like, you know, that makes sense. There's a logic to that. I think I, you know, as young kids, we were around our parents and, uh, you know, we hear them talking about certain, it's not of interest to us. I'm more interested in going to do something else. So when he came of age and really started to want to think more about that. So well, yeah, I think I think that's good, uh, Vera. I think I think that your mom um, helped to clean that piece up. I'm gonna I'm gonna move to this last question and then we're gonna go to our Q and A. And you know, in in the film, there was this moment that really uh, you know struck me. You talked about being rejected by your parents, your community, being rejected by whiteness, in fact, due to your civil rights activism and reaching a point where you knew there was no turning back. Like you used that language. And I thought that was so powerful that you had reached this point where there was no turning back. What has that meant for you um, in other facets of your identity as a daughter, as a mother, as a grandmother? What are the lessons? Well, if you can't turn back, you got to move forward. I think that's mm. the main thing. But um, I just, and the movement became family. You, you know, your immediate family and all might not be in favor of you or even want to see you. But the movement was family right to the end. Yeah. Um, and... Julian Bond, John Lewis. Oh, John Lewis could give some good hugs. Yeah. If you and haven't watched Loki's tribute to John Lewis, I think it's on YouTube. You got to see that. Mm. But it's when, when we see each other, we may not have seen each other for decades. It's like old home week. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's. In terms of your, and, I know, mm -hmm, go ahead. No, go ahead, your turn. I, I just wanted to uh, thank you for sharing that. Are, are there more, any, any stories? I know that um, the loss of John Lewis, as I'm sure many of your comrades in this battle was very difficult. Um, do you have any stories you wanna share around him and your connection, uh, even Stokely? I mean, any moments that you might leave us with about these great uh, civil rights icons? I'll say something on Stokely. 
I've said we were friends to the end. But if you were his friend from the early days of the movement, not some white person, you know, union type coming down and trying to tell folks how to do things, but if you were really in the movement together, you were friends. Mm -hmm. I took, um, and he go out of his way to acknowledge you. Mm -hmm. He was speaking um, at the Smithsonian, and I think Bernice Regan of Sweet Honey in the Rock had invited him. She was working mm -hmm. for them. And he gave a speech, and then things would go on all day, so we'd take breaks. And I said, I'm going to take my, I had Loki and Geronimo, his twin brother, with me. They were preschoolers. I decided I was going to take him out to meet my old friend. And some folks were saying, oh, something may happen. Better not do it. They won't understand. Well, I took them anyway, because I'm bullheaded, as you can tell. And Stokely was talking to some dignitaries in suits and ties. And between the entrance to the museum from the Nation of Islam, well, I caught Stokely's eye. He cut off that conversation with the big wigs and motioned me with his head to come on over. So I said to this guy who was the holy terror of the white Americans, the most feared man in the world to them at that point. I said, Stokely, I wanted my sons to meet you, my old friend. Stokely was well over six feet tall. He kneels on the floor to talk eyeball to eyeball with these little freckle-faced white boys and shakes their hand. What's your name? How old are you? Something like that. What's your favorite animal? And it would, you know, first one and then the other. And then he stands up and I thank him and um, we go on our way. And right. that's the way he was as a guy who was um, in the, our sit in group at Howard, who now lives in San Francisco and went out to hear a peace activist type and went out to hear Stokely speak somewhere one night, uh, some eatery where he was speaking, I don't remember quite what, and ask a question and says to Stokely after, I hope it's okay that a white guy asks you a question. Stokely said, oh yeah, what you doing now? Well, let's go out drinking together. <laughs> so that, let's go get a drink. And that's the way he was. If you were his friend, you were his friend. And John yeah. Lewis didn't forget you either. John was more the huggy type, but but a Southern gentleman, you know, in the South, if you don't hug, you're being rude. And um, yeah. Julian and I, the last time I saw Julian, it was at some gathering. And he was there with his wife and we were talking afterwards. And um, turned out we were both planning to go to London for a film festival. And the films, you know, that featured us were gonna be shown. And we were making these plans to stay a couple extra days and do some sightseeing and stuff. We were really planning to enjoy ourselves in England. But he died before, yeah. before, it, came, before it could happen. Joan, I, I just want to thank you for what has been a tremendous moment in my professional life, this opportunity to talk with you and to hear you uh, recount from your own lived experience this this important era in our country's history. And so, what we're going to do right now is open up our Q and A. I know we have lots. I of want to say one more thing. Yeah. John Lewis. The last time I saw John Lewis, I'd been invited as a resource person um, on one of his congressional tours in mm -hmm. Alabama. And the last time I saw him. We were on the Edmund Pettus Bridge and he was talking. Good trouble. Beautiful way yeah. to end our, our friendship of decades. Yeah, making good trouble. And I and I I am um, I embrace that idea and, and not and not good because it always feels good, but good because of the outcomes that, that we're working toward. Uh, you know, you all pass the baton on to those of us today and you know we'll pass that baton on eventually to others in the struggle but I thank you so much for adding that and for allowing us to uh, get a glimpse of what those relationships were like.
So thank you thank so you. much. Are you comfortable with me going to Q&A now? Oh, yeah. All I'm, right, I'm well, good. All right, well, we have our first question. Um, how does she reconcile incidents like the death of George Floyd and other black men this past year in view of her work on civil rights over 50 plus years ago? Does it make you feel discouraged? This person wants to know. Will we ever be able to overcome? That's the first question. Then I have a second one. Okay. I say that my generation took care of legal segregation. Mm. But there's still that underlying racism. And that's not gone yet. That's what the younger folks have got to do, figure out how to end racism, mm. no matter whose it's against. Yes. And uh, it would be nice if it would just even work. But it's very encouraging to see at the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, such a huge crowd and such a great diversity of participants. Yes. Yes, thank you for that. So I'll move to question number two, which is during the Black Lives Matter protests last summer, we heard many complaints that the uh, protesters should act more response reasonable. What are your thoughts on the plea for more reasonable protests? BS. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and I think people forget that a lot of the unreasonable activity was caused by outside outsiders coming in and trying to take, you know, cause trouble, bad trouble. It wasn't mm -hmm. caused by the Black Lives Matter folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, folks, you got your answer to, to that one. Um, I have a third question. What is your advice for young activists? I often feel strongly about current issues, but I have trouble taking the steps to physically attend a protest. Well, if you don't feel you can be marching in the streets, be one of the people that have the backs of the people that do march in the streets. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to appreciate how profound I thought that was uh, when you talked about these different roles that you can play in terms of, uh, you know, the activism or the effect that you can have. What are some other questions? I, I don't see any others in my chat. So I know there's some people working behind the scenes to get me some questions. Here's another. In your film, An Ordinary Hero, you talk about identifying more with the black community than with the Northern whites. Could you expand on this idea? Okay. Um, it really wasn't until well after World War II that we began to think of ourselves in many parts of the country as Americans. We, in fact, New Englanders will still tell you they're New Englanders. Mm -hmm. um, I know that my relatives in Georgia, when I was a kid, identified with their state, even their county first and foremost. Um, and Southerners always have to, I can't quite place you, they'll say. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean I can't remember where I met you before. It can, means I can't remember where you're from. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't know where you're from. Where are you from? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, where are you from? Are you Tell asking me? me? I'm asking you. Oh, okay. Where are you well, from? yeah, I am from Jamaica, Queens, New York, born and raised. Okay. Yeah. Now I can place yeah. you. Yeah, oh, yeah. I see what you're doing. Okay, yes, yes, yes. But I'm a proud West Virginia now. I, I think that I have been in West Virginia long enough or, or, or more years than I spent in, uh, you know, New York City, so. You're a transplant. Mm -hmm. I am a transplant. That, that's exactly right. 
We have another question and I'll encourage people to, we still have some time. I encourage you to submit a question if you have one. Uh, someone wants to know, what was your first night like on campus at Tougaloo College? I don't know if you can remember that. I don't think I remember my first Oh, night. yes. And this is one of Loki's oh. favorite stories. Ah. Ah, well, back then on a, on a campus, they did not have suites where you had, you know, every other room had two rooms with a bathroom in between. You had down in the middle of the hallway, you had a room with the sinks, the toilets, the showers, you know, all that, but just one room. So you had to get your, find your way down there. Well, my first night on campus, Mother Nature called me and of course the lights were dim to save on electric power. And I had on what we called a shorty back then, a little a sh sort of like a nightgown or something, but it only came down halfway down your thighs. And the one I had on was very pale colored and I was very pale colored, having been in prison all summer. And mm -hmm. I was tiptoeing quietly down the hall to the washroom. And apparently mother nature had called a girl at the other end of the hall and she started tiptoeing down and saw me and she screamed bloody murder. She thought she was seeing a ghost. <laughs> and she startled me, so I screamed back at her. But as I say in the end, Mother Nature won out. We both made it to the restroom. And I think by morning, every girl in that dorm knew that there was a white girl on campus. That was my first night. Wow, wow. And yes, Loki did ask that question. I didn't realize that at the time, but that was his question. So well, I appreciate that um, memory being shared for the last year. It's a good one. Yeah, well, now Loki is named for the Norse god of mischief. So you mm -hmm. see, he's still up to it asking that question. I see. Okay. He's living up to his name. Hey, and while we're on the subject of Loki, what how much influence did you have over uh, his becoming a member of the Distinguished Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated? Well, I Those think are he, the he grew up, you know, knowing that I'd been part of Delta and meeting some of my sorors. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I, I will claim all the good credit, you know, good credit. Yeah. But he went um, to be interviewed when he wanted to pledge. And the mm -hmm. dude asked him, well, why do you want to be an Omega? Mm -hmm. you know, white boy. He didn't say white boy, but you know, he was thinking it. And Loki said, well, why did you want to? And the doc guy said, well, because my daddy was an Omega. And Loki said, well, my mom was a Delta. Same difference. Mm -hmm. And that uh -huh. was pretty much the end of the discussion. So I claim some credit. Okay, okay, awesome. But, um, and all, you know, growing up and all, he was at Tougaloo College from time to time. We'd be down there on summer vacation and stop by and see my old professors. And um, a lot of, of course, my yeah. friends from my college days were basically African American. So he was very comfortable with this whole scene. Yeah. In fact, they, um, there's a, church um, in Salt Lake City where mm -hmm. a lot of black Mormon, Loki's a Mormon, LDS, and a lot of the black Mormons get together and have an old down home church meeting. And mm -hmm. Loki was clapping as they were singing. And one of the guys says, that boy knows how to clap with the backbeat to it. And <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, he, he absorbed quite a bit at the civil rights meetings and the, yeah. all of that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we have another question. Yeah, so I'll yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the histories of race in the United States are often erased or not marked. Have you encountered folks from communities where you participated in activism who are unaware of this history? If so, do you engage in conversations about these events? Well, 
I'm not pushing myself forward, but you know, if something comes up about what did you do when you were in college or somebody's talking about in some way, I can chip in my two cents worth or maybe my whole dime's worth. Yeah, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. I'm not self-promoting. Is yeah. that Loki cutting yeah. in? But can you see it there? Well, here's another one. I'm not sure, because as I read these off, I, I, I'm not exactly sure who is asking. What is your favorite memory from college of, uh, of the riots? Your favorite memories? The favorite memories of what? Yeah. Yeah, it says, what is your favorite memory from college? Oh, from college or the riots? Right, the good looking guys, of course. Um, <laughs> you weren't boy crazy, Sora, were you? No more or than man. you, than <laughs> you were. Um, I guess I do sound that way, but no, I also think very fondly of how I was accepted by mm -hmm. the other folks mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I. I just quickly became part of the gang. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. What I'd like to do is, um, oh, we do have another question in here. How do you see the future of racial America? How do you see the future of racial America? Well, things are getting better, but I mean, mm -hmm. it seems like we get over one problem some or somewhat over one problem and another one pops up. I mm -hmm. mean, it, first we, it was the Indians that were gen having genocide against, then it's African Americans, mm -hmm. segregation, mm -hmm. and Hispanics at the same time. In fact, some of the Hispanic um, got college kids were coming to this black college kids, SNCC, trying mm -hmm. to get ideas on how to do things. Um, mm -hmm. And now, but being Hispanic isn't quite as mm -hmm. uh, detrimental to your well being. Now, Asians are being attacked again. Of course, it's not the first time, but. Right. And um, yeah. And, and what about this? Uh, you know, I'm happy that you mentioned that, you know, our efforts to, uh, you know, we go from the tragedies of, of this summer, of which, you know, prior to the summer, we, we had um, been dealing with, uh, you know, state sanctioned uh, violence against African Americans, but we also moved into the era of uh, Asian hate and uh, the tragic deaths, most recently of uh, eight women, six of whom for Asian and, and just this sort of ongoing perpetual um, system of uh, terror and, and, and racism. And what, what are your thoughts about this moment, particularly as someone who is activist and who can offer a word to those of us who are looking to be responsive in appropriate ways? What, what, is, what is your thinking about that in this, in this time? Well, I'm planning to go to an Asian restaurant as soon as I can get in the door. Um, mm -hmm. But just be nice to people. Um, mm -hmm. Speak up. Somebody asks, mm -hmm. you know, says something anti-Asian. Yeah. So it sounds like what you're, you, know, you, know, you don't have to say, well, my best friends are Asian, but you know, go right. ahead. No, I think I froze for a moment. I apologize, but I, I think I heard the last part of what you were saying, um, supporting, you know, Asian businesses and also, you know, being, having a voice, amplifying your voice, right? And, and, and you know, the charge to all of us that it isn't just, you know, when we talk about um, the issues that communities of color face, and then there's also tensions between, you know, communities of color that are byproducts of uh, sort of this white supremacist structure, which we're all a part, right? So we're often pitting, you know, our tensions against each other. Um, 
there's a question in here and I wanna make sure that I get this one in. Uh, at a PWI, by the fact that it is a PW, PWI, most of the people are white. How do you honor the people of color in racial justice work that they should be leading when there are so few people of color to do the work? Um, did, did you get the gist of that question? No. So a predominantly, yeah, I, I think I probably- well, Predominantly it white way. institute now it's, it's coming. Um, yeah, so when you're a you predominantly white institution, the, you know, you talked a lot about, um, as someone who does this work as a white woman, really you're saying to others, listen, listen to the people who are affected the most. And I think this questioner is asking, um, how do we do that sometime without really overburdening, uh, for example, faculty and staff of color? How do we take up and take responsibility when there are often very few of us as persons of color? And so when we take on that work, it can feel like a real burden and, and more than what we can bear, particularly, you know, sometimes with faculty. So the, in, in this particular context, what is your advice uh, for white folk who are trying to do this work? They don't want to overburden and they do want to hear from, you know, um, or be supportive of their colleagues of color, but there aren't that many of them. Well, um, when you have to, you know, have choice on a book to read, find something that would relate to that. And then when somebody or another white person says, oh, what are you reading? Tell them what mm -hmm. a great book it is about, you know, Pakistan or Sri yeah. Lanka or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. When people say, oh, where should we go to eat tonight? Mm -hmm. You don't have to take a Midwestern menu place. Mm -hmm. get, get, oh, I think mm -hmm. some curry would taste real good. Let's go to daddy, mm -hmm. daddy, da. -de -da, -de -da. Um, just drop a, the support for people of color into your actions and words whenever you can. Um, right. Okay. And when Thank you. people are looking, yeah, for, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, no, this is, this, yeah. And, and I actually have another question here. Um, as black people, we aren't usually given access to conversations between white Americans on both sides of the divide. Can you let us in on some of the more difficult conversations you may have had during the movement with other white people who weren't supportive and who you might have been able to influence um, and who I don't might really have... think so because there was not a lot of conversation I would have had with white people who disagreed. Basically, they were just calling me an inward lover. Or, I see. You know, things like that. Right. But there so, was no so... reasonable conversation. Yeah, that's sort of interesting. You know, it reminds us really to, pay, to, to think about that context and hostilities and this idea, the presumption that there would be these opportunities. You, uh, I know when you talked about there being no turning back, you sort of moved into this space of being an outcast. And so where we may presume you have this uh, opportunity for these sorts of conversations that does not in fact exist. As we prepare to wrap up our interview, we're about five minutes uh, away from our closing time. Are there some things you'd like to share with us about the Joan Trump, or, uh, Trump Power uh, Mall Holland Foundation that you currently run and okay. ways that people- mm -hmm. I do not run it. My son, the mischief man, set up this foundation and put mama's name on it without asking permission. He runs it. The most I have to do with it is sometimes if I get an honorarium, sending it to him for the foundation. No, now, no, Loki. No, mom. You, yes. Why, why do you complain that I honor you? I'm not complaining. You, I'm you, stating you're the only mother that. that complains that their son would actually honor them. Would you and... please talk about the foundation <laughs> since you do all the details and all? Sure. So the Joan Trump Power Mall Hall Foundation was established to end racism through education. 
and to preserve and share these stories like my mother's, for example. And so uh, we provide you know, books and films and uh, curriculum for schools and, and the like. And, and so people have an opportunity very easily just to go to the found. If, if people are looking for something to do, right? For example, um, you know, going to our foundation's website and even a, a simple $5 monthly donation, you know, kind of like a NPR sort of sustainer mm -hmm. model uh, goes a long mm -hmm. way to, to help us continue yeah. the work that we're doing right now. Yeah. One of the things we're doing is we're finishing up a uh, documentary with Jerry Mitchell um, about Emmett Till, for example, mm -hmm. that's one of the things we're working on. So, and the story that a lot of people haven't heard and that will be available mm -hmm. for the uh, foundation. Awesome. Well, I am just uh, very happy to have had this opportunity. Um, I thank you, Joan, on behalf of the West Virginia University community, our broader community that is watching uh, for your time here today. I ask you and Loki if you would hang on a bit as we close out. To those of you who joined us today, thank you so very much on behalf of the WVU Advanced Center. We appreciate you tuning in. We hope that you were able to gain something from this conversation. And we look forward to having more conversations that uh, continue to further our work as an institution toward transformation and the fight for uh, justice and equity for all. So on that note, we're going to close out. There is a closing slide that provides information, a link to the uh, Joan Trump or Mollahan Foundation. Uh, where you can purchase the documentary as well as where you can view it on Amazon Prime, and then a link to the WVU Advanced Center. We appreciate you and thank you for a wonderful uh, even, evening. I guess it's an early afternoon, but thank you so much for joining us. Have a good evening.